I mean, I didn't know much about Dundee growing up, funnily enough. It was one of the towns I didn't really come to. We went up to St Andrews and beyond, except, of course, you know, when I then went to work for the BBC and it was all the part, political party conferences and so forth, and Nine Wells Hospital was doing such extraordinary work. Then it was the discovery. Mm-hmm. Um, but people are so passionate about being from Dundee, about being from the city, they feel it very strongly. And I wonder what you, or life was like for you as a student here these years. Did Dundee feel like a place on the way up or did it feel quite... You know, industrially depressed. No, I think the phrase up and coming was always used. And for me, growing up in Aberdeen, Dundee was a place we passed through to go to the south. So when I came here to be a student, you know, you see a whole different side of the city. I think Dundee's quite a it's quite a gritty place. It's always been the underdog. The fact that there's not a lot of varied employment here, so the creative cluster tend to stick together and everyone sort of fires off each other. I think. Uh, Yeah, I think it's a city that has a place that can really um, sort of incubate that talent and that those sparks. Hello, I'm the journalist and TV presenter Kirsty Wark. I'm the illustrator Johanna Basford, and we are here at the V&A Dundee for Meet Meet Me at at the the museum. Museum. Today it seems like we really are on the banks of the Silvery Tay. We are. It's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> and, and right in front of us is the rail bridge, the one that survived, the tremendous rail bridge. And that's amazing. I mean, I've never been here before thinking, well, I've been here before lots of times, but I've never been here before thinking it feels like it's birthed. I know. It, it, when you come out the train station, it's the first thing that you see. And I always think you can't quite find your way in. It's like such a huge building with like a secret entrance yeah. almost. It's quite a modest entrance and then it makes it even more special because you know you're going to see something quite extraordinary but it's actually like going through some dark cavernous space. It definitely is. You feel like you have to uh, follow the crowd to find your way in. It is, it is secret, but you but know it must feel so different to you because how many years were you here as a student? I was here for eight years, but it was before any of this stuff started. And just at the tail end of my time here was when the plans were coming in. And I remember thinking, a marina. We've not really got a yacht parking problem in Dundee. <laughs> I just couldn't visualise it. <laughs> but having you know V and A Dundee here is going to be inspirational for presumably a lot of the next generation as well. I mean, this is all about design. Yeah, massively. I think, uh, and you'll know yourself, and you've got and you've got kids or, you know, if you've got a family, going to an art gallery or a museum used to be really stuffy, but something like this is so inspirational because yeah. it's, it's sort of a new wave of stuff. They can look yeah. at things, they can touch things, there's activities. It's just... It's a more inviting space. Well, it's a sort of 21st century way of, of looking at design and design heritage. The whole point about the V&A as well is it's a living space that new stuff happens in as well. I think that's what's so exciting about it. And also, it, go and meet at the v and You go and meet there and then see what happens. I know. That's what we're doing. Space. <laughs> we are. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> So as we walk in, there's a huge glass staircase that goes up to the galleries and a great big cafe with loads of seats and loads of areas to get your cup of tea and have a little wander around. But the staircase is wonderful, isn't it? I I love the fact that you can... And it's really practical because if you're older and you want to have a rest, it's a pretty big floating staircase. But there's actually benches on the staircase. Yes. So each time you go up a different level, you get a different (laughs) view and eventually you get to the top and you can look out over the top galleries. I often see just a lot of very tired toddlers (laughs) lying underneath or on the benches refusing to go any further. Yeah, I, I, I think this is a great play space. It's just a massive nursery space. It is. There's lots of hiding with, with a shop, naturally. <laughs> yeah, of course. There could not be a museum without a shop. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So we've got our art fund passes today. Great. Well, with your art fund pass, you will be getting 50% off our temporary exhibitions. Otherwise, the museum is free all year round. And have a fabulous day. Great. Thanks very much. That's lovely. Thank you. Am I right in thinking this is the first time you've been without your kids? Yes, it is actually. So usually we're flipping our heads through all the little low windows. But and I love that. I love about. it. And actually, thank God, sometimes you think it's not going to be warm when you walk in here, but it's warm today. I first went to Calvin Grove Gallery when I was about eight with uh, my grandmother. And it was not long after um, uh, the visionary uh, cultural head in Glasgow had bought uh, Daly's Christ of St John on the Cross. And it was at the end of a very long corridor and I was absolutely terrified out of my wits. Really? (laughs) I found that painting so terrifying for so long because the perspective is so weird. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. And uh, but. 
I can remember going with her and I can remember going regularly with her and that made a really big impact to me because in Kilmarnock where I grew up we had a wonderful uh, 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 the Dick Institute which was a library but upstairs the museum had kind of mangy animal heads oh yeah I know exactly the kind you know it was like a provincial <laughs> museum with kind of mangy animal heads just stick to the books and the art well, I also went to galleries with my granny. Maybe it's because my parents were always so busy. But uh, my granny used to take me to the art gallery in Aberdeen and she would get me to kind of calm down a bit because I think a child's first instinct is to run through, see everything. And she would ask me loads of questions. So it would always be like, where do you think they're going in this painting? Or what do you think's happening just to the right of the picture frame? And it was that idea of opening up your imagination and making you consider the backstory to pictures. And I love that. I love God, the idea a of a story. That you had. Yeah, she was good. <laughs> and there was always a scar at the end as well. <laughs> Even better. Well, here we are in the Scottish Design Galleries. This is quite a large room. It's quite dimly lit, obviously, to like preserve things. So you can see everything, but it's not super, super bright. And I love that. It feels like a bit of a a treasure trove and the casings are unlike anything I've seen before. They're wooden but sort of glass fronted. It is look, like looking into a, a curiosity shop I think. I think one of the best things in here is the, it, it, obviously the stuff but the, the, the way it's presented in the casings is almost like you're in some emporium. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. An emporium of Scotland. It, it is, it is. And uh, yeah there's just so many different things. There's textiles, there's fashion, there's furniture. I think what is so captivating is that it's like a little bobble will catch your eye from something you haven't seen. So what, you've been in here with the kids, but what has the piece allowed you to see that you perhaps haven't seen before? Well, I've never actually noticed the things that are up high. I think uh, by default your gaze is quite low when you're in, <laughs> trying to keep an eye on them, but there's so many wonderful textiles up there. Now you see, that these are Jesse M. King jugs and sugar bowl. Isn't it beautiful? You know, they just show a level of craftsmanship that, you know, we're so used to big mass-produced things now that to see something that's been made by hand, you know, and, you know, made with love, it's so different. And Jesse M. King did the illustration uh, for this poetry book by William Morris. Amazing. She is just such a star. I don't think people would realise that all the things in this room are made by Scottish people. You know, you think of what we typically think of as the stuff that we make, and you would never think of all these things, the diversity of it, the breadth of the things, and the level of skill and and craft. Like, it just, we play ourselves down. And quite a lot of this stuff has been made here, exported halfway across the world, and it's now come back again. (laughs) And look at the intricate, the marquetry on uh, that bureau. I might want to touch that, but I know that you're not allowed to. (laughs) This was designed by a Dundonian, Bruce Talbert. It was a prize-winning cabinet designed for the 1867 International Exhibition in Paris. You know, look at that. You know, it's, got, it's inspired by Gothic architecture. It's got a whole variety of woods. It's highly decorated. Uh, it's got lovely... Look at the ceramic um, tiles. Oh, yeah. I love all the little drawers and the little secret places for your knick-knacks. Like, I, to me, that's really interesting. And yeah, you wouldn't believe that that was made here, (laughs) by hand. When you look back to your childhood, were you aware of good design? Were you aware that things made you happy when you looked at them, particular things? Yeah, I was the kind of kid that um, was very opinionated and I knew what I liked and what I didn't like. But more so, I was very aware of things that just didn't seem to work well. Like, I remember we had some cups in the house that you just couldn't really use very well. Like, the handles were all in a weird shape and a weird place. So I think in terms of design, you know, there's visual design, like pretty things, but then also functional design. What about you? Beauty and utility. Yeah, I was aware of design. I can remember different things. I can remember the very 60s sets of red and black cups and the saucers had red and black marks on them. And I can remember that was very modern. Mm-hmm. And um, we had quite a lot of Scandinavian stuff. And when I was 14, I worked in a, a, a Danish shop in Kilmarnock, bizarrely, a Danish design shop. Uh, and so I was very aware of Scandinavian design. Mm-hmm. 
and um, mid-century was still actually in people's houses when I was growing <laughs> up. And, and so I, I've all and beautiful fabrics. For me, I think fabrics are important. I know we're going to hopefully see some beautiful fabrics in here. Um, but good, well-cut clothes that last a lifetime, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. Hi, Kirsty Hazard. Yes, uh, I'm a curator here at V&A Dundee, so I'll be showing you the commission here today. Great, and so what are we going to be looking at today? I mean, you know, I've been in here before, but it's lovely to be taken around mm. by one of the experts. I know. <laughs> and so I'm going to show you Mae Fredman's commission, uh, which is called Plain and Ornamental of Every Description, which Let's is just over here. Yeah, thank you. So this is Walter McFarlane and mm. co, who's, whose house was two doors down from us. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. rather beautiful inside. It's even still, it's owned by an artist mm. at the moment, actually. But just the, 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 the reach of uh, McFarlane's was amazing, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So the, the whole idea behind Walter McFarlane, so he um, was based in Saracen and the north of Glasgow. So really the whole of... Postle and, and Postle Park, what it is today, was basically created by Walter McFarlane. It didn't exist before that. Um, so Walter McFarlane was a producer of iron structures. And what was really interesting was this is the sort of height of the British Empire. So these, these structures went across the world. So what we're seeing in this commission is just um, the spread of, of where these structures went to. But what we're actually seeing here are beautiful, detailed mm. drawings and indeed some photographs. <laughs> of you know decorative pieces they could be arcades could be bandstands mm -hmm. and they could be bridges they could be gates and i find it quite extraordinary that there were like thousands of men in Possel creating these gates to go to far-flung places mm -hmm. and people were getting them on the basis of just looking in a catalogue yep. <laughs> you know that my father said well i'll actually have that pair of gates i'll have that bandstand thank you this would look nice at the front of my house but it was so visionary just to send a catalogue and salesmen all over the world, yeah. all over the empire. Exactly. And um, to go back to how this whole thing came about, so we commissioned Maeve to basically look at one of the many objects that we have here in the Scottish Design Gallery. So we've got 300 objects. And we basically said to her, take one object and really explore the themes and, and the ideas behind that object. And the object that she picked was, I guess, quite a non-assuming object as you say it's a catalogue that sits mm -hmm. in the display case just to the left of where we are just now a lot of people probably walk past it they don't realise what it is um, but she was so interested in as you're saying just the beauty of these objects oh. and the descriptive language that was used and uh, the themes that come out of it that that was the object that she chose mm -hmm. to make this commission out of which I think is amazing actually So here you get a sense of the Intricacy, and it's in, yeah. as, as somebody who's an artist, Johanna, mm -hmm. that is uses intricate work. The intricacy of some of this ironwork is extraordinary. Yeah, and I love that. You know, it's, it's a really fine, detailed mm. sort of kind of art, but it's made with this big, heavy, robust mm. material, yep. and you know, the two don't seem to go together. <laughs> so look up there. This was terminals. You know, this is for ter terminals for roofs, spires, turrets. And building decoration. You could actually get your little, your turret yep. <laughs> sent over mm -hmm. and put in. Look at this one, look. So you've got the original drawing and you've got the drawing of this particular bandstand in Adelaide and then you've actually got the structure there. It's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, we actually got something very similar, much, much closer to home. So right here in Dundee, we've got an example of one of these bandstands in uh, Magdalen Green Park, which is... 15, 20 minutes away from where we're standing right now. And that was a Walter McFarlane one? It was Walter McFarlane. Is that a full-size bandstand or the tiny little one? We've got both. Okay. <laughs> it's a funny sort of <laughs> market. Miniature There's miniature bandstands, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> I like these drawings long at the end because as a person that draws myself, I know how much I use a computer just to sort of help tweak my hand drawings. And this must have all been done by hand, meticulously measured out, squared paper, you know, to get those drawings exactly right for the engineering process mm. makes me nervous. Yeah. <laughs> but look, this is, you know, there, you know a, a worker, an iron worker from Glasgow who perhaps never even left the city, mm -hmm. his handiwork ends up in the Sao Paulo railway station in the refreshment stall. Mm. I think that's, that's amazing. Crazy, yep. isn't it? It's exactly as it was designed. Mm. It hasn't changed. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. That's extraordinary. 
you know, there are lots of um, things you can say about empire that weren't good and colonialism. And, you know, we have to own it. We have to own the fact that perhaps the fact that, you know, McFarlane's was so successful was because we were colonists. Mm -hmm. But I think we can still celebrate the glory of great design and the glory of endeavour and the fact that hundreds and thousands of people were employed in Scotland making things of great beauty, beauty and utility. And I think the the craftsmanship, we, we really should celebrate that. You know, there's so much... So much stuff is made by people that we don't know so far away. And, you know, I think there's a tendency to think that we're not good at anything, but that's just ridiculous. You, know, you can tell from in there that we've been amazing at making stuff and coming up with ideas for centuries. And I think it's just a, a wonderful um, story to inspire us to stop looking outward and to start keeping our talent here and showing people that they don't have to move away to London or New York or, you know, any of these places to, to make it, as we always used to say, like now you can stay here and, and compete on a global level from as home. As you do from mm -hmm. home in the Aberdeenshire countryside. I do, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking my great-grandfather used to take furniture from Glasgow to Canada really? in the late 1800s. And when I look, perhaps he wasn't taking some of that beautiful stained glass bookcase work mm. from Wiley Lockheads. But that was the material that was going all over the world. And when people are wandering around in Adelaide or Johannesburg or in Sao Paulo, they have no idea. No. No idea. <laughs> Made by a wee man in Dundee. <laughs> no, I love that as well. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> when um, I was growing up, I had these two uh, maiden great aunts and they their brother had been killed in the war and had a really huge effect on them and actually a lot of young men obviously didn't come home from the war in Glasgow mm. and um, so they never married but one of them was particularly they were both really creative and they were china painters oh. in their spare time and that was a really big thing and now when I go into second hand shops Oxfam shops look around I can often see in plates of theirs. Oh, really? Yeah. But they were amateurs. Mm -hmm. But there was a real thing in the turn of the century, in, in, in just at the beginning of the 20th century in Glasgow, about China painting courses. Oh, amazing. And it was a, a particular outlet. And there were the most beautiful detail flowers on mm -hmm. the, these China mm -hmm. sets. And these Extraordinary. days, they would be classed as, you know, craft artisans. Absolutely. <laughs> and then they were just sort of slightly batty old ladies <laughs> yeah. painting. It's maybe still the same, actually. <laughs> Before we let you go, can I ask you to come and tell me about this extraordinary dress of Christopher Keynes, who has to be one of the most wonderful Scottish designers Yeah, I'd be today. delighted to. Describe this dress to me, Kirsty. It's extraordinary. <laughs> uh, it's this dress. This is from his Autumn Winter 2015 collection, um, and it's a dress called Lover's Lace. And the story behind it is fascinating. So um, Christopher took life drawing classes uh, out of his studio in London, got his whole team to do life drawing. And this dress is inspired by the sketches that they did together. So it's, uh, it's a sort of beautiful confection of lurex and uh, Swiss lace. The idea is this just these sort of beautiful entwined uh, male and female figures that um, are around the whole of, of, whole of the dress. Mm. So that's the the sort of upper part of the dress and then underneath you've got this yeah, beautiful um, beautiful lurex fabric that just moves so incredibly when you walk um, and I just think it's absolutely incredible as, as an object. He's actually at the end of these pieces of lace he's got feet. Mm, <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's so beautiful but all I can think of is the questions that I would get like yeah. mummy what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a an iconic and different piece that you know people don't have a reference point for something mm. like that is it art is it fashion mm. is it design it's a combination of both mm -hmm. is it sex well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's really lovely as well in my sort of previous curatorial life i was at uh, vna south kensington i worked in the uh, fashion department um so i worked with christopher studio to pick this dress for the galleries and this is the dress that he chose to be represented in and is that how it works when you take on a new object do you work with the person you know the the designer and then they help you select the piece or do you go with a shopping list <laughs> <laughs> we had a shopping list um so i think with christopher because there's so many pieces that you could have picked to mm -hmm. open the galleries with so i think we went with five or six objects uh, presented it to him and this was the one that he decided to go with wow
you know, you come through here and then you've actually had no idea what might be waiting for you around the corner. Yeah. And it turns out to be, oh, it's just a Macintosh tea room. <laughs> a secret hidden treasure. And I think that's where we're going to meet the director, Philip Long. So we're in the Oak Room and coming into this quite enclosed, quite a dark space, beautifully lit by these Macintosh designed lights. And so it was a great coup for the V&A to have a full Macintosh room. And it wasn't always like this. I mean, obviously they had to do a lot of restoration. But Philip, here you are. How often are you in this space as the director of the V&A, a Macintosh tea room? Well, I walk around the museum very regularly most mornings to see if everything is, is fine. And I love coming in here. To me, it's the, it's the heart of the museum. There's so much about this room and its relationship with the building, with Kengo Kuma's architecture, uh, that I think is, is really profound. When we started developing v and Dundee and uh, wanted to put Scotland's design at its heart, of course, Macintosh has to be absolutely central to that. I think one of the things about v and Dundee has been in a really ambitious project, and so it's been possible to do really ambitious things within it. Um, for many years, it's been known that uh, there was a series of Macintosh rooms in storage uh, in the care of Glasgow Museums. And so quite early on, we had a discussion with Glasgow Museums, who, who very quickly uh, jumped at the opportunity with us to say, let's see what we can do to conserve and restore one of these, to bring them back into being and put them into the wider context of Scotland's design history. Uh, this room, the Oak Room, uh, was really the principal room of the Ingram Street Tea Rooms, opened in 1908, operated as a tea room about till the 1950s. Philip, can you take us through what we're actually seeing, the forest, the idea of where we actually are? Where, imagine that it's, my, it's actually my grandmother drinking a cup of tea in here, and what does she think she's in? Well, people would have entered uh, the Oak Room through quite a small doorway, and as they entered through uh, a dark entrance and moved into the space, the space would have opened up around them, and people would have looked up and have seen up to the quite high ceiling and a mezzanine level, which is supported by columns, but columns that are quite elab elaborately treated. It's as if they are trees or oak trees, which rise up and which spread out with this wavy um, uh, lathe woodwork holding up the mezzanine level. It's, it's been compared rather as if it's walking into a, a forest uh, glade with these little shimmering points of light through these purple sections of glass. You have really spent most days of the last year, and beyond, obviously, here. But has your view of what the gallery means to you changed? Has your view of how people would, you might have thought of, used the gallery changed? Well, I think that the reason that we do exhibitions and, and I suppose, make galleries is, is to find out more and to uh, confirm or otherwise what our understanding might be of what the subjects are that we're dealing with, what, what, what creativity, and in this case, Scott's creativity, is all about. So it, not really until we realised and finished the Scottish Design Galleries and, of course, restored and installed the Macintosh Oak Room, which hadn't been seen for so many years, that anybody is really able to make a, a judgement, an informed judgement, about the importance of all of that. And I think that my sense since we've opened the museum is that Scott's design creativity and Scott's internationalism, especially through hundreds of years, mm. I think is, is, is even more so than, than perhaps we suspected when we were developing the, the curatorial themes for the, for the galleries. I think a lot of people are surprised when, when they're in this gallery and they see all the stuff that we make and that we have made. Like, do people realise that it's all come from Scotland? I think quite a lot of the feedback we get is that it is a revelation. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're really surprised to find out, for example, the, the influence of Scots in, in Russia in the late, in the late 18th century. Uh, and onwards, the connections between Scotland and Japan, uh, the fact that uh, people from around the world came to Scotland in the early part of the 20th century to learn how to design and to build ships. It's mm -hmm. an extraordinary story of ingenuity and innovation and entrepreneurship that this gallery is here now permanently to tell us about. I mean, there's so much going on in Scotland now. I think there's much more than people ever give us credit for. I think we tend to have a bit of a... 
you know, it's those awful hats that you see in airports with the, the red hair and the tar. And like, that's what people think of when they're thinking of Scottish design. And, you know, you tend to just go to the default sort of categories, short bread, tar and all those things. But there's so much more. And I've got friends because we all went to art school together that are makers and designers and artists. And you don't really appreciate the breadth of the talent that we've got here because we're so focused on a few sort of mm. quite boring <laughs> highlights. The thing about a place like Dundee is, it is this kind of engine of creativity, also in technical uh, mm -hmm, and technology, mm -hmm. um, that there is creativity in technology as well. Creativity is just ideas, isn't it? So you can have creative, think creative thinking in any sort of walk of life, whether it's engineering or computer game design. You know, people speak about beautiful equations in mathematics. And although I absolutely cannot see that, I can appreciate that there's like mm -hmm. creative thinking there. So I think, you know, yeah, it's it's igniting those sparks and keeping them alive. And one of the ways to keep them alive is to have places like the V&A. But for me, it seemed extraordinary that we didn't have a V&A in Scotland for so many years because we were, you know, we were the big engineers of the empire for good or ill. I know. Uh, we were the designers, you know, we were the people that made all those, you know, wrought iron bandstands that went mm -hmm. out to far mm -hmm. fun colonies and so forth. And so these were, these were the things that actually in a way, identified as, as being Scottish, that kind of engineering tradition. So I'm so glad it's here. It's just about 100 years over. <laughs> Do you maybe think it's that Scottish thing of working really hard, but being a bit sort of sheepish about it and <laughs> not wanting to draw too much attention to it? And it's like we've finally got over ourselves and went to shout about it. <laughs> As I understand it, you're going to give us quite an unusual treat. Uh, we are, because we're going to take you upstairs to the mezzanine level to look down across the room. Normally, it's not somewhere we can let every member of the public coming in. We have so many people visiting the museum, and there are conservation requirements for the room that, that don't normally allow us to doing this, but seeing as it's you. Great. <laughs> After you. how low the balcony is. What's also quite nice to talk about up here is that not all of it is, is restored. We've purposely left uh, some of it uh, to show uh, the condition mm. that it was in when we restored it. Uh, the intention that we took with the conservation of the room was to restore it to its 1907 design um, and not invent anything by Macintosh. Perhaps photographs will come forward that give us even more of an idea. But really, the, the room itself was a challenge to conserve, mm -hmm. especially because there was so little documentary evidence. And uh, the way that we had to put it back together uh, was, first of all, to reconstruct it in an unconserved state to understand how it was put together. So uh, there are parts of the rooms that visitors look very carefully. It's possible to see that we haven't uh, restored, we haven't stripped the wood back to its original finish and refinish. So where are you taking us to now? Well, let's go and see uh, some more of the museum, particularly the public spaces, uh, and talk a little bit about the ideas that brought those into being. So what are we seeing here, Philip? Well, we're looking at uh, uh, the work, uh, really a studio reconstruction um, uh, of the fashion designer Nicholas Daly. Uh, he's the most uh, amazing guy who came from Dundee. Uh, his, his family, his parents met here in Dundee. His mother um, worked in the jute mills. His father came across from the Caribbean as part of the Windrush generation. And they had a shared love of reggae. And they started reggae clubs <laughs> in Dundee in the 80s. And uh, they developed them in, uh, in Edinburgh as well. And uh, Nicholas, now grown up, trains as a fashion designer and is based in uh, London. His work is influenced by the most fantastic modern jazz music uh, and by that sort of culture that he is part of in London. But he is very, very aware of his Scottish heritage and he loves using textiles of tartan and of tweed. And he's working with some of the most traditional, long-established textile factories in Scotland to make these extraordinarily beautiful, very comfortable beautiful. clothes. And also working with companies like Macintosh, Yes. Uh, who've been going in Scotland since the mid-19th century and making these wonderful all-weather coats, um, but to his 
um, amazing uh, designs. I love this space because it's got all the natural light and it, yes. it's always the, it feels like a busy part of the, the gallery and the museum where you can like look out yeah. and see other things look, going on. When you guys look around and there's nothing when you're looking all the way around yeah. here. There's nothing that's not wonderful to see. No. You know, whether it's going down those stairs or going to that really good restaurant or these exhibitions that are contemporary, amazing. There are large public spaces, or if you like, non-traditional gallery spaces in v Dundee. It's a museum that people can come to and look at objects in more traditional ways, within display cases, uh, in the way that, that historical objects need to be presented. Uh, but it is also a museum that our architect wanted to be this living room for the city, uh, this idea that it is also a place for community, a place where lots of different things can happen at different times of the day. Johanna was wondering if you've had a wedding yet. We have had inquiries about <laughs> weddings. We've certainly had lots of parties. We've had filming the one of the one of the um, one oh, of the succession. episodes of Succession uh, was filmed here. That was an extraordinary night where at uh, five o'clock every evening the film crews kicked in and they were here until dawn. Uh, outside the museum, we've had the Antiques Roadshow uh, happening around the museum with people bringing their own design objects from across there uh, from from generations uh, with the backdrop of the of the museum. So, uh, you know, I hope that it's very much a place that it will carry on being used in all of these different ways. It is about the stuff of every day. It is about uh, design. I love that you said that people were coming to do their homework. I yes. just think, if you were a kid in Dundee, you know, and you're traipsing about not wanting to go home, and you've got, you know, like a shopping centre to hang out in, you know, the corner of a park, how amazing to come in here Absolutely. and be surrounded by all this homework stuff. Classes. Yeah, I know, but it's just really inspiring. But also you've created something that's going to be, you know, a kid of 10 is going to see, bring their kids to it and their grandchildren to it. There's no doubt that Kengo Kuma, the architect's vision, was um, it is it is a kind of monumental place. It is. It is. There is no doubt that it is monumental. And you know, I come back and every time I think it's changed a bit. And I know that Kengo Kuma, the architect, wanted to be seen as a living room for the city. In fact, books even named that. You're a bit sceptical so far. I am. Um, having been in many living rooms in this city, I can't see any likeness, but that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the space and think it's amazing. But, you know, there's not a couch and a big light and a TV in the corner. So to me, it's a very, it's a very exciting, fun, social and public space. I just don't, I just don't get the living room reference, but maybe, maybe that's just me. Well, it means that every child now growing up in Dundee thinks this is what your living room has to be like. <laughs> It'd be a challenge. It'd be a bit of a shock. <laughs> I know. Welcome to student halls. <laughs> but no, I think it's it's a it's a wonderful inviting space, and I love that. You know, I think sometimes you go into, for example, if you go into a fancy clothes shop, you can feel a little bit looked at. Well, the architect scary. designed. You know, and you go in, and you think, well, I mean, and I do appreciate the architecture. Mm-hmm. There's some amazing architecture designed uh, shops, but you think. Is this about me just feeling comfortable mm-hmm. or is this about a statement? Yeah, it can, it can be a bit pretentious and off-putting, but you don't get that here. You are welcomed in and the flow of the space takes you in and, yeah, it feels welcoming as opposed to scary. You might not yet think it's a living room in the city. Once it's got a few bottles of wine in it, <laughs> some beer might be. <laughs> <laughs> but there'll be a generation that will go up in Dundee and it'll become, for them, what places like the Dick Institute and Kilmarnock and indeed... Kelvin Grove Gallery in Glasgow, mm-hmm. where to me as a child. So we're heading into the Edmondson Gallery, which is the big, big, big travelling gallery, as it were. And God, what, what is, look at this beautiful wood. What, what's going on here in Hello Robot? Well, this is our space for changing exhibitions. Our Scottish design galleries are a permanent installation, always there, always free for people to come and absorb that massive story of Scotland's design. When v Dundee was first developed as an idea in partnership with the wonderful v Museum of Design and Art and Performance in London, an ambition was to have a, uh, another place in, in our country that v extraordinary exhibitions could be seen, could be seen more widely by people in the UK. And so we have here an exhibition space which matches the scale um, of what is possible at the at the V&A in London. And it enables us to, alongside telling that 
international story of Scotland's creativity to bring uh, other work from around the world to hear and to explore design topics and ideas. And um, now the exhibition Hello Robot, which carries on until uh, the beginning of February. It looks into, it investigates the relationship between human beings and robotics. It really is an exhibition about humans designing robotics for human humans. use. Yeah. And That's the difference. Very much so. And I think that it, it, it certainly leaves me with a very optimistic view because the, the, the sorts of designs that uh, people can see um, in the exhibition, uh, and, and not just design ideas, but actual robotics, are very sensitive to the human condition and to human need. And I think it's very uplifting in the way that uh, design and robotics is looking at human need from across all ages, from nursery to, to old age. Philip, it's been so lovely to have uh, some of your time because you're so busy making this museum even better day by day. It's a pleasure to welcome you back. The human has been neutralised. So I thought the breadth of the stuff in the Scottish Gallery is stunning. Like you would just never believe there were so many um, different things made here and made to such a high standard. And I think that's really invigorating and exciting. And it almost gives us a sense of what could be possible and what was possible and what should be possible again. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a, yeah, it's just a really nice set of kicking the boots for us. What I thought was that I think each time I come here, I feel a bit warmer towards it, even if that's possible. <laughs> I was here um, re reporting for the BBC, you know, when it opened. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of the people that championed it to be Museum of the Year. And I can come back and look around and see how much I feel my relationship with it's changed on the kind of, I think it's fourth or fifth time I've been here. I definitely think there's more and more diverse stuff and, you know, great examples. I mean, I want to see a big wrought iron gate in here. I want to see, I want to touch it. Mm -hmm. I, I want to have textiles I can touch. I want to feel that people can come in here and say, I understand why that's here. This is something in my DNA and I just think we need more of that. Johanna, thank you so much for coming and meet you again at the museum. Lovely. It would be a pleasure. Thank you, Kirsty. Thanks for listening to Meet Me at the Museum with me, Kirsty Wark. And me, Johanna Basford, at the V&A in Dundee. If you like this episode of the podcast, please rate, subscribe or tell a friend or do all three. And if you have a National Art Pass, you can get free entry or discounts on museums all around the country. 